If I had a dollar for everybody who said, I am so tired of this pandemic, I would have a lot of dollars. The World Health Organization has something now called pandemic fatigue. You may have heard of it. They define it as being demotivated and exhausted by the demands of life during the COVID crisis. They warn that this fatigue could ultimately lead to a longer and more devastating pandemic, and we've seen that happening. At the beginning of pandemic, they say that the short-term survival skills that we all have kick in, and fear keeps us motivated, but over time, as fear subsides and frustration grows, exhaustion and complacency set in. Here are the um, symptoms of pandemic fatigue. Feeling cynical and emotionally exhausted, Yep, I got some of those going on. Being less effective on the job, I think we all feel a little bit that way because we can't work the way we have been working all these years. Being less willing to comply with health guidelines, that one I can tell you is really happening. When people refuse to wear masks or don't want to be vaccinated for political reasons, not medical reasons. And also having a deep sense of anxiety about the future. I understand that as well if you look at the news. And some people have said to me, your problem is that you watch the news every day. I don't know how not to watch the news and know what's going on in the world for my position. But look at the Ukraine, the Soviets at the border. Soviets, I'm saying that facetiously in a way because it's Russia now. But Vladimir Putin is determined to bring the Soviet Union back, it seems. The killing of police officers that seems to be an epidemic of itself right now. And then, if you look at the rise in hate crimes that are up so much over the last years, nearly two of every three hate crimes reported last year were motivated by bias against race, ethnicity, or ancestry, according to the FBI. And of all hate crimes, 36 were anti-black or anti-African American, 10% were all white, 9% were anti-Jewish, and the incidence of uh, violence against Asian Americans has risen over 200% in the last couple of years because of the virus, the idea that it's the China flu. Now, racial unrest is certainly raising its head in the nation, isn't it? Because people are talking about critical race theory, not understanding what it really is and that it's not really being taught in any school system. It's a collegiate term, actually, for those who study race at a different level than is being presented, but the governor of Virginia just instituted a tip line for reporting teachers who teach quote unquote divisive subjects. Anything to do with race, anything to do with civil rights is now being eliminated throughout the country. That along with false reports that white people are ineligible to receive COVID treatment have resulted in threats against election officials, school boards, teachers, Dr. Fauci and the president. So what does all this have to do with Jacob? I think it has a lot to do with Jacob, actually. Let's look at who he was. If you watched the children's video, maybe it brought back some of the story to you. And unfortunately, we do treat the stories of the patriarchs often as children's stories. But I think they still speak to us today. Jacob, who stole the blessing from his brother. His name literally means trickster, supplanter, usurper. And poor Isaac. Isaac really has a rotten time in the Old Testament, doesn't he? Abraham, his father, is called. Abraham is called because of his righteousness. Abraham is called. And he responds from a God who has not interacted with people before in this way since Noah and the time of the flood. God calls to Abraham and takes him out and shows him the stars and said, your descendants will be as numerous as these. You need to go where I send you. And he gets up in his older years and takes off for lands unknown with a God whose name he doesn't even know. Then finally, after he accepts that the promise of God is true, he is given a son named Isaac in his very, very older years. And his wife, who is in her 90s, gives birth to a son, Isaac. And then what does God do? He asks God, God says, Abraham, I want you to take your son and sacrifice him to me which doesn't happen, but we don't see a lot of interaction between Isaac and God. But now finally, Isaac has these two twin sons, and he loves one more than the other. Now, maybe you think that's wrong, but most parents have a child that they understand better than the other, whether they love that one more or not. But he loves his son more. He loves his son Esau, the hunter, the hairy one. 
But when they're born, they're fighting in their mother's womb. They're wrestling in there. And then when they're born, Esau is the firstborn, but who is clinging to his heel but his little brother, Jacob. Jacob then wants that blessing, that birthright. Now we can fault Esau because he comes in from hunting and he is so hungry that he trades his birthright literally for a bowl of beans. Didn't mean as much to him at that moment because his stomach meant more to him. But Jacob takes advantage of that, cheats him out of the birthright. We can't understand that, can we? How just the word of someone is enough to change history. But we see it then when we come to the time of Isaac's death. He's on his deathbed, he's blind. He asks his son Esau, his favorite son, his favorite son, his firstborn, go out and hunt and cook for me one last time. And his mother hears this and cheats her husband. She's as tricky as her son Jacob, the trickster, the supplanter, and the usurper. She cooks him a meal that he will love, puts his brother's clothes on him so he smells like him, and puts fleece on his arm so he feels as furry as his brother. And they trick, they trick this dying man, Isaac, into giving up his blessing. And again, a blessing is a tangible thing. It confers power to the person. It can't be rescinded once given, and so Jacob has to flee for his life because his brother wants to kill him. Now, there's a story that intervenes in there that we didn't read this morning, and if you want to remember it, it's the story of Jacob being sent to his mother's kinsman, Laban, and he falls in love with his daughter, but he has an older daughter, Leah, and Leah is not as pretty. Leah is older, and he's not going to marry the first one off the second one off without the first one being married. And so he tricks the trickster and passes off his eldest daughter, Leah, as his youngest daughter, Rachel. People say to me, how can that be? You have to remember, this is way long ago in a time of veils and no electricity. He didn't know who he was marrying, and he married the wrong wife, and he has to work seven years. He marries the other wife. He has to work more time. They take off, and Laban says those words that we use as a blessing. It's not a blessing at all. May the Lord watch between thee and me while we are absent one from the other. That's like God's going to keep his eye on you, you tricking man. But then, as Jacob's lot increases, as his herds and his wives and his children reproduce, and he's got this grand group of people, God speaks to him. We sang the song this morning, we're climbing Jacob's ladder. Not really a ladder like we know, but more of a ziggurat, one of those, it was more of a ramp than a ladder that goes around and around up to heaven. Think about the Tower of Babel and that story. That's what he pictures in a dream. Angels coming up and down, not with wings, but angels being the messengers of God. In a dream, he's given this vision. What does that mean for him but that God is still active in the life of God's people? even when we are not aware, the angels are coming and going. And he is convicted of his sin, and he decides to go to his brother Esau to make peace. That's when we pick up the story tonight, or the story of that night, when he is wrestling with someone we don't know who it is. He doesn't know who it is. It's a stranger to him. And they wrestle all night until his thigh is put out of joint, and he will limp the rest of his life. That's when he understands after this interchange when he needs the name, because the name, like the blessing, contained power, tangible power. If you knew the name of your opponent or the person who has come to you, you have power over that person. Now, the wrestler asks, the stranger asks, Jacob, what is your name? And he says, Jacob, and he says, not anymore. You get a new, new name and a new identity, Israel. The people of Israel are born at this moment. Abraham was called and his descendants were made a promise and the promise is going to come through true through this trickster, this usurper, this supplanter of God's will. And then he says, I want your name. And the stranger doesn't give him his name, but then he puts his thigh out of joint and he leaves. And that's when he realizes he has indeed wrestled with God. That's what we're doing right now, isn't it? In COVID, we're wrestling with God. We want to wrestle with each other. We're beating up on each other. We're blaming people for mask mandates or for 
not wearing masks. We're blaming people who are vaccinated and people who aren't vaccinated. We're allowing every human distinction to separate us one from the other. We're feeling sorry for ourselves, to be honest, and whining a little too much in my esteem. But if we look at the word of God at these times, and that's why I picked these passages today. Now, Barry can tell you, because Barry is the one who does the PowerPoints right now. Barry's like, do we have a bulletin yet? Do we have one? He has next week's last week, but this week took me a long time to come to this. So what do I do when I don't know what to preach? I wrestle with God myself, and I wrestle with the word, and I ask God, what message do you need me to give this week? And God said, go to the ones that mean the most to you in this circumstance. My very favorite passage of scripture is our call to worship this morning, Romans 8, 38 and 39. I am convinced that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the passage that I used for my, the basis of my thesis in seminary and the basis of my ordination answers came from this, the fifth and sixth chapters of 2 Corinthians. Listen what it says again. We have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. Wasn't easy, was it, to be a follower of Jesus Christ in those days? And it's not that easy today. But what are we promised? We're treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. It's time for us to claim the promises of God in Jesus Christ. If Jacob, as much of a mess as he was, could not undo the promises of God, how much more can God do through us when we come together? We need to come together. We need to remember our past. It was a Spanish philosopher, George Santayana, who's credited with saying, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. British statesman and um, Prime Minister Winston Churchill wrote, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. That's why we read the stories of our faith. They may seem old, they may seem antiquated, they may seem to have very little intersection with our lives, but they are the foundation of who we are as God's people in Jesus Christ. And so we go to these stories, we go to our own past. Let me tell you a little bit about my growing up years. I grew up mostly in the 70s. The 60s informed me some, but I started middle school, then known as junior high in 1970, and graduated from college in 1980. It was not until the ninth grade. I grew up going to church all those years, but in the ninth grade when we saw the films on the Holocaust, that something inside me changed because I felt the faith that I had been taught coming to terms with the world in which I had lived. And that was when God said to me, this is not how I want people to live with one another. This is not how people should be with one another, and I need you to speak on my behalf to do something about that. Then the next year, we saw the films on Hiroshima. I'm not going to debate with anybody whether the United States should have dropped a bomb on the people, but I was blessed when I went to Japan to visit Hiroshima to see what happened there, the devastation there. I was there and there was a Japanese woman next to me sitting on a bench and she looked at me and with tears in her eyes raised out, reached out her hand and took mine. Japanese people don't touch each other, they bow, they don't shake hands, but she grabbed my hand. We sat there and wept together over what had happened. But the fact that I could be there as an American and I could be there with a Japanese woman and we could say that that was the past and we can't go back there again but we could learn from it and move forward. But you know what? I didn't learn about the Civil Rights Movement even though I lived through it. Not in high school or college. I didn't know who Emmett Till was until I went to seminary. I'm not gonna debate critical race theory. That's a different animal. But if we stop teaching history because it's uncomfortable, we will be doomed to repeat it. If we cannot deal honestly with the fear between peoples because of skin color or history or ethnicity or ancestry or place of origin or accent, we will be doomed to live in a world that is just at each other's throats. 
We can't live like that. In the name of Jesus Christ, we cannot live like that. We need to learn from each other. We need to open our hearts to one another. We need to reach beyond our differences and find what we have in common. Our Jewish brothers and sisters, according to St. Paul, who was born a Jew and a citizen of Rome, on his mother's side Jewish, on his father's side a citizen of Rome. But then he came to faith in Jesus Christ, and his life changed, and he became the missionary to the Gentile world. He didn't care what anyone else said. He was going to take that message with him wherever he went. To think that we live in an era now where just a year ago, on the 6th of January, swat stickers were carried into the United States Capitol sickens me. And people with shirts on saying six million were not enough, meaning we should kill the Jews. St. Paul the Apostle said, that is the tree of God's chosen people and the people of God in Jesus Christ are the branches grafted onto that tree. We have Asian Americans, members of this congregation, and their lives have been threatened lately because of false information being disseminated because of the virus. And I can tell you for certain that you can be a white person and be treated for COVID-19 if you go to the hospital. We have to stop threatening one another because of political differences. We have to focus on what we have in common through Jesus Christ our Lord because that is who we are in Christ. We are the people of God in Jesus Christ. We have everything we need in him. We may have nothing on a temporal level. We may feel like we have no money, no power, no, no ability to change the world, but we do because Christ has changed the world for us, Christ who is in us. Jesus prayed for us. I have asked not only on behalf of these, meaning those around him at the time, the 12 who were about to desert him in the garden, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. That is us, those who will believe in me because of their word and their witness. We need to witness to the power and the healing power of Jesus Christ in this world. That's the only thing that will save us. The threats have got to stop. There are people in congregations across America who will not speak to each other because of political reasons right now. We've got to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, we will not let anything divide us one from the other. I know some folks have left our congregation because of the mask mandate and because we've closed, and there are other churches that are open without masks right now. But our group has come together very prayerfully, as United Methodists do. We're not a congregational church. We don't put everything out to a vote to the whole congregation. But folks who are asked to serve come together, and we pray at every meeting that God's will might be revealed to us, and that's when we make decisions together. So I hope you can understand our reticence to gather at the height of the Omicron variant. We'll be open again soon. I don't want us to give way to COVID fatigue or pandemic fatigue, because we can get through this if we pull together. Nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in all creation can separate us from each other as long as we hold that love to be primary in our lives. People have wondered why God would wrestle with Jacob and not just knock him senseless, knock him out. That's not how God acts. And it reminds me of the image of the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. What shepherds do is not just stand there on the hillside with the sheep looking pastoral, the word pastor literally means shepherd. A shepherd's job is to clear the grazing pasture of anything that might hurt the sheep, whether it be a poisonous plant or a scorpion. They're protecting the sheep with just a stick between them and a wolf or whatever animal might come or whatever thief might come to steal the sheep. They will give their own lives to defend the sheep. But it surprised me to learn years ago, I don't even remember where I learned it, that often when a sheep falls over the side of the hill and if it's stuck in a branch, if it's going to fall to its death, sometimes the shepherd will leave the sheep there until it wears itself out trying to save itself. And that's when it can be safely pulled up to safety again. I think that was God and Jacob. Jacob needed a little convincing. 
seeing the angels going up and down the ladder or the ramp or the ziggurat, whatever the, the vehicle was, showed him that God was with him and he accepted the blessing and he made peace with his brother. And he goes to Esau and what does Esau do? But he welcomes him with open arms. Jacob learns, even though he is the one through whom the promise will come true now, he bows before his brother and his family bows before his brother's family and he stands to find his brother's arms open welcoming him. We need to lean, learn from these stories. We need to learn from our own history, but we need to revisit these stories again and again and to know that God will maybe wrestle us sometimes because we cannot just take God at God's word. We have to fight. We have to argue. We have to fuss. But eventually, we will prevail. That's why we picked the first hymn this morning, Standing on the Promises, I Cannot Fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God, I shall prevail. I might be limping, but I will stand on those promises the rest of my days. And I hope you will stand with me to the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.